Well, hello, everyone. My name is Rick DeYoung, and uh, I am the Educator and Artist Relations Manager here at KHS America, and I'd like to welcome you to our fifth event out of a series of seven, and tonight's event about building a better percussion or uh, building a strong percussion section. We have two great clinicians that will be joining us, Mr. Scott Brown and Mr. Mike Lynch. I do want to remind you that we do have a chat section on the right-hand side and do encourage you to go ahead and get engaged in there to talk with the uh, clinicians as well as, well as with yourself. And also, uh, if you have a question, um, click on the question button and ask away and we will get to your question as soon as possible. I will come back on the stage at the conclusion of this to remind you about next week's clinic and about your professional development certificate. So please welcome our clinicians for this evening, Mr. Scott Brown and Mr. Mike Lynch. Thank you very much, Rick. And that was beautiful music for the introduction. Um, I'm Scott Brown. I am actually a middle school band director at Dickerson Middle School in Marietta, Georgia. And I also um, started a percussion ensemble program there, um, I guess, 21 years ago now. And uh, in addition to that, I'm the percussion director at Walton High School, which I am actually in one of the ensemble rooms at Walton right now because we have percussion ensemble rehearsal going on. And uh, I'm the official county person to be here to make that legal. So you may from time to time hear some percussion ensemble music in the background. So hopefully it sounds fantastic. Um, so that's me. I'll let Mike go ahead and introduce himself as well. So thank you, Scott. I look forward to our conversation this evening. Also, thank you to Rick Young for putting this together and for hosting the event this afternoon or this evening. A little bit about myself. I've uh, I retired in 2016 with uh, 32 years of band and percussion teaching experience. I was an assistant band director at middle school and taught percussion at middle school and the high school level. Um, since 2016, I've still been freelancing as uh, as far as teaching percussioning in the area in middle school and high school. I was at uh, Lasseter High School teaching percussion there for 24 years. And through all those years, I was very fortunate to be part of some great programs. I had some great students and we got to play some uh, really cool venues like Midwest and the Music for All National Festival and Pasic and some other things. So I've been very fortunate. So hopefully with uh, some of our experience that Scott and I have, we'll be able to to share some of this information to help you with, with some of your programs. So thank everyone for, for tuning in. Yeah, and the cool thing is to me and Mike uh, talk together for a long time. So we have a lot of the same approaches to, to um, how we do percussion, percussion education. Uh, the title is Building a Strong Percussion Ensemble. Um, and that's actually kind of a, I guess, uh, I don't know if you'd say a narrow or broad term for what we're actually doing. We're gonna talk about, you know, in particular, you know, how to approach percussion as a um, potentially non-percussionist, even though I think with both of us, this stuff applies to how we approach percussion as well. And I think both of us being middle school band directors, um, that has kind of changed our perception of how to teach percussion. So it's kind of a, a, a broad um, concept. Um, and also, I want everyone to know that, you know, we have put together 10 slides of information and we are more than happy to go through and talk about everything on each of these 10 slides. Um, but I think we're also, um, we would be grateful for you guys providing questions, you know, anything that you came and hoping to learn, uh, we're perfectly fine, you know, just totally tossing this clinic out, you know, out the door and just answering your questions if that's what you guys need. So by all means in the chat, um, and I think uh, Rick is also monitoring the questions section by all means just you know if you have something we will stop what we're doing at any point and answer those um so moving ahead um first thing you know start with what you know you being a musician and a band director and i think a lot of the the intimidation for non-percussionist um, band directors when dealing with percussion is you don't know the techniques you don't know um you know which bell mallet to use and those types of things and i think that's probably the least of your concerns, to be perfectly honest with you. If you're really thinking about, you know, develop critically thinking musicians just like you would in any of your other instruments, um, that's your best starting point. And, you know, use your musical skills and your musical knowledge uh, to your advantage. Um, talk to percussion with the same terminology as the winds. You know, I think this is extremely important. Um, a lot of times in percussion, for example, marching percussion, we like to talk in terms of heights. You know, three inches is considered a tap height or piano. Um, so I know at, at Walton, and we did this at Lasseter too, 
you know, if I have the kids, I want them to play piano. At the beginning of the season, we have to establish what that is. So we do talk about three inches, but there's definitely a turning point where we stop using, you know, those terms and we start talking to them about piano and forte and mezzo forte. And, you know, try to talk to them the same way, you know, we talk to our wind players. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this one too, and I'll see if, you know, Mike, if you have anything else, but some of the best clinicians we've ever had for, for you know, percussion ensemble were non-percussionists. And I remember specifically um, bringing in John Culverhouse one time to work, you know, from the University of Georgia, then Kennesaw State University, to come in and work with my students. And I remember he asked me, do you not want to bring in, you know, Dr. McCutcheon, who was the percussion person? And I was like, well, we've had Dr. McCutcheon in, and he was fantastic, and it was amazing, but I wanted to hear what you brought to it. And it was really cool. And this kind of approaches that gets into the next thing because he would sit there and say, can I have a brighter sound? Can I have a warmer sound? Whereas a percussionist, we would say, can you go get such and such model bell mallet, you know, or go get such and such, you know, so what, what that led to is the kids um, kind of taking ownership of figuring out how to make that sound. Um, and I think that's really important to make sure that the kids, you know, are treated as mature musicians and given those those opportunities. Um, Mike, you, anything to add so far? Yeah, I just think sometimes as uh, you know, you bring in wind players and they don't know the the limitations of some of the percussion instruments we have, and so we sometimes uh, think about those limitations and kind of maybe kind of let things slide. For for example, you know, playing a lyrical piece on marimba, we know how difficult it is to roll and when when having to shift from one note to the next note. Well, a wind player doesn't know. They just know it needs it needs to be smoother. So I just remember someone coming in sometime and having them listening to a piece like that, and they were just talking about uh, some of the notes being accented uh, when shifting and uh, and some space in between the notes. Where maybe I would have let that slide, but uh, you know, when again, the wind players don't know the limitations. So them, it just sounded uneven. That was good to hear. Uh, you know, bringing in another percussionist, maybe let, let that go, Mike. But uh, a wind player with a different set of ears. I thought I thought it was really good to listen to what they had to say. Yeah, I definitely think we, <clears throat> as percussionists, we tend to terms and we tend to talk a lot in terms of technique. Um, and I think it's really good. Something I've learned from wind players and from teaching, you know, band, you know, not to talk in terms of the technique so much. Talk in terms of the music and have them use their creativity and their knowledge, you know, and help them out, obviously, but. You know, I think that's important. Um, and we've actually got a student teacher right now at Dickerson and oh, and at Walton. And uh, I was talking to her one of the first few days because she was like, I'm really not very comfortable with my clarinet fingerings. And I was like, hey, guess what? Neither am I. I haven't taught you know, clarinet specifically in years. And now I've got a seventh grade clarinet class because we can't have all the students in the same room. And I was like, you know, just don't be honest with them. Just tell them, you know, if they ask you a fingering and say, I'm not sure. Let me check. You know, and it's the same thing with percussion. If you don't know how to play it, that's fine. You know, just give give the kid a resource or use the resource yourself. And we'll talk about some of those in a few minutes um, and learn with the kids if necessary. And this is, you know, I do this a lot. We have a fantastic uh, PTSA at, or at Dickerson. And, you know, they bought us a Samba Ensemble a few years ago. Guess who doesn't know or didn't know a thing about Brazilian Samba at the time? That would be me. You know, and I got this set of samba instruments and I was like, this is fantastic. Um, now let's figure out what to do with it. And, you know, the kids, we, we researched together and we researched the history of, you know, samba in Brazil and this, you know, the music and everything else. And we learned together how to play the instruments. I brought in people to work with us, you know, and I, I think a lot of times people shy away. It's like, well, I don't really know how to do that. So I'm not going to talk about it. And that's, you know, be honest with the students and say, you know, Let's figure it out. We'll work on this together. Um, so and continue with what they know. Um, most teachers and kids see students as empty vessels waiting to be filled with knowledge. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of students walk into the room and teachers treat them as though they have no previous knowledge of whatever it is they're doing. And students seem to accept that. And they walk into band class like, well, I don't know how to do any of this. And I'm thinking, well, actually, you do. You know a lot more than you think you do. Um, so I, you'll see the beautiful picture there. I see them more like beautiful statues covered in bird poop and dirt. And I even tell the kids that that's what I see them as. That's always kind of funny the first day. But, you know, the thing is they know, you know, I, my oldest son, when he was 
maybe a, a year old. I remember him grabbing a pair of drumsticks, you know, sitting on our bed and, you know, just started hitting the pad. And I was like, dude, that's perfect. Like his hand was so relaxed. The stroke was so relaxed. And, you know, I feel like and I tell the kids, you know, when you grab sticks as a sixth grader, as a beginning percussionist, you're so tense mentally thinking about all the things that you have to do. You know, I have to, it takes me forever to get back to that nice relaxed grip you would have had when you were a year old. Um, and, you know, they've been surrounded by quality music, you know, their whole life. I know my kids listened to baby Einstein and baby Mozart when they were still in the womb, you know, and, you know, listening to great movie soundtracks. And, you know, at, at the very least on the radio, they've heard, you know, quantized music their entire lives. So, and the thing is they know when something sounds good, they know when something sounds bad. And I use that to my advantage a lot of times, you know, when talking instead of addressing technique, I'll be like, okay, guys, did that sound kind of harsh to you? They're like, yeah, I was like, okay, so what can we do? What can we do to fix that? What can we do to, you know, to change how that sounds? And they'll help come up with ideas. And that's something, you know, you can do as a non-percussionist or as, or as a percussionist, you know, the percussion people up there, you know, again, ask the kids, how did that sound to you? Did that feel like, okay, raise your hand if you thought that was not in time. Okay, did it feel like it was speeding up? Okay, well, guess why it felt like it was speeding up? Because it was speeding up, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, and I, my thing with that is, you know, how do you fix it if you're speeding up? Their first comment, by the way, is to say to slow down. I say, no, play it in time. You know, slowing down, you could you know, end up going the other direction. So point of that, you know, slide is the kids have a lot of prior knowledge they bring with them. Um, and they can use their ability to hear something you know you ask if that sound did that sound beautiful no okay well didn't sound beautiful to me either so what can we do to fix that um all right so before we get into the basics any questions out there you want me to just keep rambling on yeah sorry mike go ahead <laughs> no if i mentioned there uh we do have a dropbox there's gonna be a link to a dropbox that has information in it and so, so there's a lot of items in the dropbox tons of things that we're not going to talk about tonight so make sure when they put that Dropbox up that you, you take a look at that there's also some videos and some recordings in there and if you look at it while we're doing the uh, the presentation and had you have any questions about anything in the Dropbox we'll be happy to answer those questions also yes yeah, so that's actually the next thing so as far as those resources um, like you said we've got the Dropbox link um, and we just honestly put together, there's some article, there's some clinic handouts that Mike's done, some things that I've done for the kids. We've got like, uh, you'll see my 25 rules for success. Feel free to ask about that later. Um, you know, a lot of information. We put some videos of our drum lines, of our percussion ensembles, some audio recordings, lists, literature lists, you know, you name it. Um, a lot of stuff just that we use typically, um, you know, ourselves. And we just wanted to make those available to you as well. Um, so Mike, you want to talk to them real quick about, you know, we, what I, the point of this is you don't have to know the techniques, provide them with quality resources. Um, so Mike, you want to talk to them about Vic Firth real quick? Yeah, there's, there's so many resources out there now. Uh, one of the first one that comes to mind is the Vic Firth website, Vic I think it's actually VicFirth.Zillion.com right now. And there's so many resources on that website. There's one uh, called Percussion 101, where they go through, I think, a dozen or a half dozen percussion instruments and talk about the techniques and there's even a little quiz at the end of each video and I would use that a lot when teaching middle school or still do when teaching middle school I would have the students go to that like the night or two before I was going to teach something and look at that before I taught it so that way we kind of had a head start and I didn't have to start from ground zero so there's a lot of incredible information on that website uh, there's Dr. John doing 40 essential rudiments, uh, Julia Gaines, four mallet lessons, Mark Wessels doing beginning snare drum lessons. So there's just tons of stuff. Some of you I go, uh, some drum set tracks, there's tons of information on that site. Uh, also, there's a, a book out that Scott and myself wrote called Field Level. And even though it's geared towards marching percussion, uh, we did put a lot of information as far as the front ensemble, uh, keyboard technique, two and four mallet, timpani technique, we went through a lot of the accessory instruments and talked about technique with those instruments. And so all that material not only applies to marching, but it, it applies to concert also. Then of course the Dropbox, but we could keep going. Uh, the Percussive Art Society has a wonderful website and some of the information's free. Some of it, you do have to be a member, but the cool thing about that is you can, uh, you can do a group membership for your school 
And so not only does the director have access to all that material, but your students have a, has access also. So you could do assignments just like I was talking about with the Dick Firth. Um, tell them to go there and look for, um, you know, uh, articles on, on playing a tambourine role. And so things like that, do that ahead of time. So the PAS website is awesome. Uh, Steve Weiss, their Facebook page, they're doing a lot of great things now on that, and a lot of good interviews. And even a lot of the percussion composers have websites that have some great educational artists or articles. And a couple that come to mind is uh, Josh Gottry and Edward Freitag. Uh, both of those have websites where you can get a lot of free information from them. So a lot of great resources out there. Yeah, and I um, should have included this. I actually saw an interview with um, him yesterday. But Marcus Hawkins, H-A-W-K-I-N-S, M-A-R-C-U-S, Marcus Hawkins, has a ridiculous uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, so there, the thing, point of it is there are tons of resources out there. The PAS thing that Mike mentioned, the group membership, you can get that. I think it's $200, and you get a full membership for all of your students. It's something like that. We're, we have a group membership at Dickerson, and it's fantastic for the kids. Um, so and all these resources, and people, you know, ask me a lot how you know how do you teach your kids to do such and such and to be perfectly honest with you i don't to start off with because i realized i don't know probably 10 15 years ago that those kids because when i when i grew up and i know mike's the same way we didn't have all these resources we didn't have all these options to go out and learn things um and my school didn't have a percussion teacher i didn't we didn't have a percussion instructor at our high school um, you know, so I had to drive, I lived 30 minutes away from the city. I had to drive somewhere to get information, uh, to have a lesson with somebody, you know, and it took a lot of effort to learn and I wanted to learn. So I put in the effort and I realized the kids were just kind of, you know, sitting there, you know, sucking off my brain for knowledge. And so I just, I, and it was funny the day that I realized, wait, they're not going to lift a finger as long as I'm willing to sit here and spoon feed them information. They're just going to sit there like sponges. So it was like the, honestly, the second that that clicked in my head, it was like, nope, done. You guys are going to figure things out for yourselves. And at that point, you know, I started providing resources for the kids. So for example, our sixth grade percussion class is not in with our sixth grade band class, um, which allows us to move a lot faster, which is pretty awesome. Um, but then when they get ready for their winter concert, their first concert is sixth graders, which is when we have our beginners, um, the concert is usually on a Thursday. So for example, last, last year, I handed the kids their music on Friday and they, I told them to go home over the weekend, look up, you know, cause we hadn't covered accessory instruments, look up how to play the instruments that they were given. And on Monday, they were going to teach the class what they learned. So they came in Monday, kids sat there and taught everybody, you know, the things. And of course I've got things that I do differently. So once I saw that they had put in the effort, I'd say, okay, now here's how I want you to hold it, or here's how I want you to play it. Um, and then Tuesday was their first day in with the band. And we hadn't practiced the music. We hadn't looked over it as a group. And it was their, um, the expectation was that Tuesday you come in prepared with the knowledge of how to play this stuff. And that first rehearsal is always a disaster. There are usually a couple kids that cry. And, um, you know, after rehearsal, I'm like, okay, raise your hand if you thought you were prepared. And all the hands go up. It's like, okay, great. raise your hand if you still think you were prepared. Nobody's hand goes up. And we talk about that. So Tuesday night, they go home and practice their tails off. Wednesday, they come back in having learned their lesson, and they give a concert on Thursday. And that's kind of my yearly thing ever since I realized, you know, to do, you know, to stop spoon feeding them and stop teaching them everything um, and giving them resources instead. So uh, just like you know, we're telling you guys, you don't have to teach them everything. I don't either, you know, on purpose. And I don't know, Mike, how you feel about that. No, that's, that's why I have that list of resources. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, quit, quit, you know, going off our brain. Um, and a lot of the information you guys have, you know, grip equals embouchure, you know, and, you know, you know how you get a good tone on a wind instrument and percussion is the same way. If you squeeze the stick, you get a bad sound out of the instrument. And same thing with the stroke. You want a nice, relaxed stroke. Um, the baby bird thing is a little bit gruesome, but you know it sticks in my kid's head. Um, I always tell the kids to imagine they've got a little, tiny, fragile baby bird in their hand when they're holding the stick. And uh, you know they want to show their friend, and they don't want to get up there to their friend, and the bird's gone. You know, So you got to keep your hand curled around. 
but you also don't want to go up to your friend, open up your hand, and you have a mess of like feathers and blood and you know bones and stuff. So um, keep it relaxed. You don't want to squeeze it either. Um, I've even gone to the extreme of telling them to imagine they have their thumb on either side of the neck. So point is relaxed grip. You can stick with that. Yeah, and I, I, I think the stroke is you know is the same as developing wind players. When you're talking to wind players about breathing and their breathing technique. Well, the stroke is exactly the same thing to a percussionist. So you can't neglect the stroke and playing a good full stroke. Uh, you wouldn't teach wind players by playing piano all the time. Uh, you got to teach percussionists on a pad to play a good full stroke, just, you know, putting, putting air in the instrument. So that's the same as playing a good stroke with a percussion instrument. Yeah, absolutely. And the word relaxed, I think, is probably the word we use the most. Yeah. You know, trying yeah. to you know, trying to get kids to play with good sounds. Yeah, if they ever say anything about tightening up or tighten, I, we never, I never use the word tighten about anything. Uh, yeah, I occasionally use firm up, maybe squeeze, but never the word tighten. Yeah, firm is about as extreme as I will go, and I even yeah. have to explain to them that that's like you know, firm is in like squeezing fruit to make sure to see if it's good. That's yeah. about as firm as you're going to get. Um, so sound is vibration. Um, and we kind of talk about that with the kids. Um, we create vibration by a violent collision between two objects. And I know that sounds kind of strange because we just talked about keeping everything relaxed and I actually have my triangle sitting here beside me so I can demonstrate what that meant. And I came up with that saying one time when I was talking to the kids about playing a piano note or a pianissimo note on a triangle and trying to get the, the best sound possible. And the goal is with whatever instrument you're playing on to get the instrument to vibrate or get a portion. If you're playing on a drum, you wanna get the drum head, the drum to get the instrument, the air column and everything vibrating. Um, and that's the important part of percussion is creating that vibration. And I've heard people use the term a lot, draw the sound out of the instrument, you know, and you'll hear that. Well, let me show you what happens with this triangle when I try to draw the sound out of it. Nothing, right? You can't do it. And I've had kids that they have a soft note, so they touch the triangle. And it's like, okay, you're not creating enough vibration. So I actually came up with that, you know, violent collision concept and I uh, asked the kids, you know, if they'd ever seen any of the, you know, the Horton Hears the Who or any of those, you know, old movies with the, the, um, the Who's, you know, and I, I know with the, my, or uh, the Grinch stole Christmas, you know, it, when it zooms out, they're on like a, you know, a snowflake. The entire thing was existing on a snowflake. So I tell them to imagine that they're, you know, or who's living on this triangle when they play it. You let the weight of the triangle create that sound for you to get that vibration. I can even feel the vibration from it in here. And that was a very soft triangle note, but it was also a good sounding triangle note, if I don't do say so myself you know, because it got the entire thing vibrating. So the violent collision is for the who's, you know, doesn't mean you hit anything hard, but you always, you know, have to create that vibration. Um, and throw mass never hit, you know, for example, with the tri triangle beater, you never want to do this. I would do that sound, but you don't want to listen to it. You let the mass of the beater create that sound for you. Okay. And you throw that into whatever object you're, you're playing and kind of go along with that. You throw a baseball to someone, not at them. And then they throw it back. And it's kind of like that with any stick or mallet you're playing with. You want to think of the concept of throw, um, not hit. Um, anything about that stuff, Mike? Uh, no, I'll tell you what, going down, there's a little couple of comments I want to make as you move on down. Okay, cool. Um, so next thing, hardness of mallet affects articulation, not volume. And I've heard many directors and many percussionists you know, say, you know, I need a bigger sound here. You know, can you get a harder mallet? And I'm like, well, actually, that's going to give you the opposite result. Um, you know, mass, you know, height, hardness of the mallet affects articulation, not volume. Volume comes from height, velocity, and mass. You know, so if I want something to be louder, I'll, you can do it from a higher height, you can do it from with more velocity, or you can get a bigger mallet or a bigger implement, bigger set of symbols, whatever it is and create more mass. And then the combination of those three, you know, will give you that more volume. Um, so oftentimes, you know, if somebody wants a wants something to be louder, they need something bigger and heavier, 
not something harder. If they wanted to cut through the ensemble more with more articulation, that's where the harder mallet comes in. Anything yet, Mike? Yeah, just an odd. I found it has uh, helped through my career that, uh, first of all, all the mallet and stick companies out there today, all the major brands, make really good products. So I found that it helped that I deal with one, one company mainly. And so that way, when I'm on the podium and I'm wanting a brighter sound or a darker sound or a bigger sound or whatever, I know what mallets that company makes and I need, I know what number to tell the students to use. Um, so sometimes we get into a situation where we, uh, we have a student playing something we don't like the sound and if they're, they're all got totally different mallets, then we're just kind of going from one student to the next. Okay, what did you have? All right, use that mallet. Okay, let's try this mallet. And sometimes that's great because you, you do find some things that you really like. But I found to just for quickness and for my peace of mind, I, I pretty much stick to one company and I'm familiar with their product. And that way, when I need a mallet change, I pretty much know what to go for. I know what mallet to tell the students to go get, what number to tell them to go get. So that, that may be helpful for some of you folks out there. Yeah. Um, so I just looked at the questions. So we actually do have some questions, Mike, if you want to go over some of those. Sure. Um, so first one, Jim Rogers, when do you start, when you start your beginning class, how do you decide who gets to be in the percussion class? Um, and me and Mike have, I think, totally different ways that, that, you know, Mike used to do it in the way that I do it. Um, so I, we can both kind of answer that. Um, for me, um, it's kind of gotten crazy at Dickerson where, um, and we do it like a two week rotation at the beginning of the school year where the kids get to go and, you know, they spend a couple of days in the band class to see, to let them try out all the different band instruments. And so we can talk about, you know, what the instruments are like and show them to them. A couple of days in the orchestra class for the same thing. And they usually spend a day or two in chorus rotating through. Um, and the whole goal is, and, and then we have some pickup days if they've still not decided anything after that so that they can kind of, you know, we want them to make an informed decision and we want to help them find an instrument that they will have long-term success with. So um, because of that, every kid in the school has a chance to go through the band room, chorus room, orchestra room. Um, and the good news is, I mean, usually we have 400 plus, you know, sixth graders. There are usually fewer than 10 that choose not to do band, chorus, or orchestra, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, but because of that, there are a lot of kids that try out for percussion. Um, either because they're interested in it or because they had to do something. So why not percussion? Um, which is, you know, that's always kind of, you know, fun trying to figure out which kids are really interested in it and which are just there to check it out. Um, but I go through, I bring the kids in. I think we usually have, have around 130 kids try out for percussion. And I'll bring them in, talk to them about what the class is like, what the expectations are like. Um, I will uh, bring them up, have them, um, you know, play like, some technique stuff, eight on a hand on a drum, try to get them to play it back. I give them a few corrections, then I'll have them play some rhythms for me. I'll just play a rhythm for them, see if they can play it back. Um, and then I'll go to a keyboard and I'll just play, you know, C scale up to see if they can, you know, hear and see that and see what their coordination is like being able to hit the smaller bars. And then I'll play a ski scale up and down. And then if they got that, I may play like a scale in thirds where you every other note, just to see if they can hear it and figure out what's going on. And then there's always the interview part process that to me is equally as important. Like, so why do you want to do this? Why are you interested in percussion? And, you know, through those things, I, I kind of give the kids a, you know, you might want to try something else type of thing, or they might not even be truly interested or, um, you know, let me kind of put this kid's da name down. And I tell the kids, you know, I'm not going to admit anybody in the class on the first run through. I want to kind of see everybody and then I'll come back and, you know, call out names and, the cool thing about that is I can always see kids that are like, you know, when I call out names, I've always, always leave room for those kids that are like, I really wanted to do percussion and you didn't call my name. So um, I guess that's how, you know, that's kind of the general process. And I usually end up with between 20 and 24. This year I have 28 um, because the COVID testing was a little bit different. So that's kind of my process that I've gone through. And Mike, you want to share yours? Yeah. Yeah, my, uh, my process was actually very similar. I mean, I always did the, the rhythm, you know, had them play back some rhythms for me. 
uh, I did talk to the try to talk to the students a lot when they were in the room to see why they really wanted to play percussion. So that was kind of part of it, just kind of see what kind of feel I could get for them. They were just trying it out, or if they really wanted to play percussion, if that was really the thing they wanted to do. So that uh, I did a little, you know, some coordination stuff like on drum set, just to see what their hands could do if they were coordinated enough to play, you know, quarter notes on one hand and two and four with the other hand, that kind of thing. And same type stuff Scott did on the keyboard. I did that. I also played the chromatic scale. Uh, just played it up like a C chromatic scale going up because I'd have them maybe start with the right hand. And I wanted to see what happened when they got to F. If they if they got that hand change, the way they, you know, C, C sharp, and then you get to F, F sharp. And so uh, that's kind of a, a big thing for me. If I could see, if I could play it really slowly and have them watch and have them play that back for me. So I always did that with them. But it was, it was, um, very similar to what Scott did um, with those editions. I usually started somewhere between 14 to 16 uh, students you know, when I was teaching there at the middle school full time. And um, I mean, we took every kid in band, uh, every kid that wanted to be in band, you know, wanted to be in the music program, got to be in the music program. But I did try to limit the percussion to around 14 to 16. Yeah. Um and Michael Pettis asked, how do you work with a percussion student who has a hard time either playing in time? And I mean, a hard time. Um, so for me, I have a couple of different things that I try to do. Um, you know, I think I've got kids at Dickerson. We're actually dealing with this today. And I have a whole thing that I go through with the kids that, you know, when you're learning to read rhythms, you use that um, analytical side of your brain. You know, we go have like five stages. First stage is, you know, you figure out the dots and rhythm, you know, the dots and squiggly things. What are they, those telling you to do? You know, the second stage after you practice for all, you get to the point where you're looking at the music, but you're not really paying attention. Third stage is, you know, you're seeing the music in your mind's eye. You're not even looking at it anymore. Fourth stage is moving to the artistic side of the brain and you're hearing the music like the, the, you know, the Florida State version or the you know, New York Philharmonic version in your head or the best player and you're playing along with it. And then the fifth stage is you hear everybody's part and you're playing along with it. And for me, typically what I've found is, you know, I have a lot of kids and school has them so much focused on the intellectual component of that. And, you know, the analytical component of that, it's like kids don't know how to let go of analyzing and thinking about something on that level to just being able to sing it. And we're working on a, actually a taiko piece, Japanese taiko drumming on our, you know, chairs right now and trying to get the kids to move into that part where they're just, you know, you know, I, we've counted it so much. And I just want to hear them go that we're trying to, you know, get them to break it down into different components, you know, fill it in bigger groupings and things like that. And I've got this one girl that's just like, she, her brain will not go out of one, two and three and four and one and two and three. And she's, it tenses her up almost. Okay. All right. Looks like we've lost Scott here. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll maybe try to continue with a little bit about what I do there. Um, so when I'm working with a student like that, what I try to do is get, a, I try to bring in maybe some pop tunes every now and then. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Scott, you back? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, okay. we lost internet for a second. Um, but what I was, I was saying, do what? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. what I was saying was, you know, instead of instead of doing the metronome, sometimes try to use like a, a groove track or something that the kids can yeah. maybe start to get away from counting and thinking about it so much. Because I think you know, we find that their hands are capable of doing it. It's the way they're thinking about it. Um, their mental approach kind of clogs up the works. You know, a lot of times when they're overthinking or overanalyzing. Um, that's been my experience. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, that's that's what I was talking about doing is I'll, I'll bring in some pop tunes that have a, a strong quarter note beat, which is pretty easy to find nowadays. Uh, and just have the kids like clap to it all four, pat their foot. And then we'll we'll start switching around. I go, OK, let's go to two and four to see who can do it that. Then I'll go to one and three. That's that's not a one time thing we do. We do that often. And then I'll come in and go, okay, everybody just clap their hands on one, one of every measure. And I think that tends to help. And from the beginning, I have all the students pat their foot or tap their toe, the front part of their foot or their toe to everything they do. 
uh, you know, when we get to eighth notes, upbeats, we spend a lot of time on that, being able for them to comprehend downbeats and upbeats. But I, I look at it, if I spend class periods doing that at the beginning, that's going to save a lot of time down the road if that's, that kid understands what a downbeat and an upbeat is. So I, I think those couple of things, and also when we're counting rhythms, uh, you know, we count and clap a lot. Uh, don't always have them clap the rhythm. A lot of times just have them clap quarter notes while they're counting the rhythm. I find that that helps a lot also. So maybe maybe some of those ideas will help you out, Jim. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of clapping the quarter note and counting the rhythm. You know, so you have one, two, and, and, and when I tell them to do, use golf claps, um, and then eventually we get to where they're not counting, they're singing, you know. So singing whatever it is that we're playing, you know, da to da to ka da da ka to da because I want them again to kind of move out of that overthinking and overanalyzing thing. Actually, it was kind of funny this year with my sixth graders. We were working on you know playing just eights, you know, one two three four five six seven eight one two three four five six seven eight, and we've been playing with the metronome. And I told them that a lot of times, you know, something that helps is if you have a groove in your head, you know, you're, you're listening to your own personal groove soundtrack because you're playing your eighth notes. So, of course, I kind of sang for me, you know, and I was like, okay, now sing your groove. Let me hear the groove that you have in your head. So it's like one, two, ready, and one, and two, and three. And they started counting eighth notes, but trying to make it sound cool. And I was like, guys, that doesn't really work. And actually, we need, to, we need to figure out what a groove is, I think. So, um, but yeah, hopefully those things help. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It wasn't Jim. That was that question was from Michael. Yeah. So there's this Chris Hankus dude. Um, I think I've heard of him before. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, do you ever include instrumentalists from outside the percussion section to supplement personnel in your percussion ensemble or drumline? And if so, are there any instruments that you would tend to put them on or any advice for integrating them in with experienced percussions? Well, um, we do, um, for us, you know, when I, when I, where I first started teaching, where I went to high school in North Carolina, um, we didn't have enough kids to fill out the drum line. So there was one year that we had a bass line that was, I think, flute player on top, percussionist on second, saxophone player, trombone, and I think another saxophone player. Um, that was our bass line. And that actually ended up being pretty good. Um, now in our current situation, you know, I've got, I think I heard yesterday we have 63 percussionists at Walton um, signed up for next year. I don't know how many are going to be in the marching band, but we don't necessarily need to supplement. But we do have um, uh, double reed players. And there's there's a kid right now, double reed player, that um, wants to, like, we don't march double reeds. So they can choose to switch to another wind instrument or they can join percussion. Um, and he's actually taking percussion lessons right now to get, you know, kind of get caught up. But we've had um, double reed players before that, you know, it's, it's funny once they get into the system, you know, they're playing, you know, bassoon or oboe, I think takes so much work and concentration and effort when they get into the percussion section, they tend to move forward pretty quickly, which is, which is kind of cool. So we've had multiple times where double reed players ended up being, you know, some of our stronger players by the end of their four years, just because they had that work ethic. So um, they typically would start off on a keyboard instrument maybe, or, you know, we've had kids that didn't play percussion that would come in and, um, you know, they played piano, so they might play a synth part or something like that. Um, but uh, normally, like a, more of an entry level, like you know, a bell part or um, yeah, synthesizer. Mike, you got anything on that? Yeah, kind of the same. I've been very fortunate that I haven't had to supplement the percussion uh, program a whole lot. That I had enough percussion kids, uh, but I, oftentimes we did have double reed players that would want to do marching band, didn't necessarily want to switch over to another instrument, uh, another wind instrument. And so we would put them in the front ensemble, keyboard players. And and so they could already read and uh, they usually caught on pretty quick. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time just working on their hands, trying to get their hands developed because usually their reading skills were already pretty good. So. Okay, Jennifer Meyer. Ideally, how many percussionists do you need in a band program? Um, approximately how much funds do I need to budget in for percussion instruments such as repairs? Um, so ideally how many you need in a band program? Um, I think a good number 
is probably around seven per band. Would you say, Mike? Yeah, pretty, that's pretty decent. That's I mean, when I was middle school full time, that's always what I tried to do. I tried to make sure I had seven percussionists per band. Yeah, and for me, I tend to start a lot more. And honestly, I have it's difficult for me to find enough parts for all the kids. But also, I'm not afraid to double. And that's something we may get to later in the clinic. You know, if we've got, you know, for me, if it's a sixth grade, if it's like seventh grade, you know, band concert, yeah, put two kids on snare drum, you know, or three. It doesn't, you know, it, it's fine. It, I mean, we're, it's not like we're performing at Carnegie Hall. So we do double parts, you know, from time to time. So I think that helps. Um, as far as how much funding you need to budget for percussion instruments, um, you know, I, I guess that depends, you know, what you've got. Um, as far as repairs, it's it's kind of, you know, at, at Dickerson, I people give me a hard time for how many instruments I've got at Dickerson. Um, I think right now we've got 12 marimbas, something like that, um, four or five vibraphones. I mean, it's it's pretty insane, but also a lot of that stuff is stuff that other band programs were getting rid of because they thought it was old, you know, or they were upgrading and they thought it was kind of past its prime. And... Um, we actually have Cobb County, you know, fun story, Cobb County used to have a marimba for the entire county. And um, if you needed a marimba for a concert, you would order the marimba, you know, from the county. They would deliver it to your school and then they'd return it after your concert. We actually have the original Cobb County marimba at Dickerson. And it's got a new frame on it. You know, we replaced some bars. We fixed things, you know. So um, I, I'm a big proponent. Whenever somebody says they're getting rid of something, I'm like, I'll take it and we'll fix it. Because the school that I taught at in North Carolina, we didn't have a lot of money. And we learned how to make things, fix things, repair things. You know, so we do have great funding at Dickerson. I'm not going to deny that. But I also, you know, I don't get rid of anything and I will fix stuff like crazy. So um, there's a lot of repair stuff you can do on your own. Um, as far as I was concerned, you're going to say something, Mike? No, I was just saying you're exactly right. I, I never got rid of anything percussion-wise. I always kept it. Because it was, I was going to find some use for it eventually. And uh, I remember getting a marimba. It was at the county warehouse. Somebody got rid of because it had cracked bars. Some of the bars, something had fallen on it and had broke the bars in two. Well, I just, I got it and ordered a couple of bars. And I, all of a sudden, I had a, a marimba that worked. So, uh, yeah, you never get rid of anything. And as, as far as budget, I mean, you're going to have to replace mallets, I guess, mallets. Uh, you got to think about drum heads, how often you want to place, replace drum heads. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of cost. Uh, a, lot, a lot of it you can do yourself. And as far as budget, I know um, Majestic and Rick can probably speak to this later on, or um, Chris can post something. But you know, it seems like there were some pretty good sales going on during the whole COVID thing for people looking to get instruments. So I'm sure that they would be more than happy to share some of that information at some point. Um, you, know, I, you know, like Steve Weiss Music and some of the other places that have been doing the same thing, you know, some pretty good deals. This is actually a really good time if you're looking to, you know, upgrade or to add some stuff to your percussion. Um, this is probably the time to do it. Um, I introduced this as Sue. Um, I introduced mallets and snare drum to my fourth and fifth graders. So they learn rhythms and note identification. We split our time between the two instruments. Is it better to introduce just drum for the first year and then mallets for the second year players? So, um, this is actually something, by the way, there's a, um, oh, yeah. a Facebook group called Ben Percussion Solutions for Band Directors. If any of you guys are on Facebook, that group has been um, fantastic. And we're actually doing a, a roundtable discussion, I think, this Sunday at 7. Um, but uh, that's been kind of a big topic on there. So personally for me, um, it's my belief that, you know, your kids, if they're starting off on a drum pad, they're starting off on about a 12-inch pad. That's pretty big um, and they've got a decent size you know stick that fills up a lot of their hand that they're playing with and you know if you work on the technique on a surface this big with a you know a stick that you know is comfortable in their hand um, they're going to have more success moving the keyboard instruments and i you know for example when you go to a keyboard instrument you're looking at a surface potentially this big with a mallet head almost the same size and a tiny little stick inside of it and you know so we spend a lot of time working on drumming. We actually um, spend the first part of the year we play on hand drums and I'm a big believer in isolation. So we work on hand drums 
And we're kind of developing the stroke on the hand drum, but we're also developing their reading skills. And we learn to read all the way up through all the 16th note combinations. Then once they do that, um, usually about a month and a half or so, uh, we start working on drumming. And at that point, they don't read music. I sit there in front of them, demonstrate, I teach them by rote so they can just focus on what their hands are doing and focus on their technique. Um, while they've been doing this, they've also been doing music theory and um, music theory books out of the Alfred's music theory. And we're actually trying Mark Russell's music theory book this year. And once they get through with that first semester, then we start going to keyboards and we start going to keyboards. We usually do a, a sight reading like video game thing. And I got to find something new this year um, just to really get them comfortable, you know, with where the notes are on the staff and, and all the theory stuff. And then we start working on, you know, keyboard exercises. And they're actually, all the exercises are in that Dropbox link. Um, and the exercises are designed to get them familiar with the layout of the keyboard. So they've developed their stroke. They've gotten comfortable with reading music, you know, via the theory stuff. And then when they start on the keyboard, we start spending a lot of time just working technique exercises that helps them understand how the keyboard's laid out um, so they can kind of see it and feel it better. And, you know, my belief is if you start them too soon with that stuff, they get frustrated easily. But if you isolate those skill sets, when they do start putting it together, um, they're going to have a lot more familiarity with everything and a lot more success. So that's, I don't, I don't think it has to be one year on one, one year on the other. I think you can do, you know, I do generally do the first semester on you know, drumming for the most part. Some years we start keyboards earlier, you know, and the other cool thing is there's always something new on the horizon for the kids. So it keeps them a little bit more you know, engaged through the process. Mike. Yeah, no, I, I did just about the exact same thing. I always started, we had one of those uh, Remo set of hand drums, uh, Tubanos, I guess. Uh, actually the general music class had those and I was always Mario them at the beginning of the school year. And that's what we would start drumming on. And just like Scott said, we'd work on stroke, but we'd also work on reading uh, with those drums because they weren't having to worry so much about technique. We'd just work on open tones and uh, we'd learn to read some rhythms on those drums, then go to the pads with the snare drum sticks, work technique. And, uh, and then, you know, move to keyboard and, uh, and so then I would just switch it up. I, I would do all that the first year and I would kind of switch it up. Once I went to uh, snare drum and keyboard, then I would just alternate it between the two. And I wouldn't put a, I wouldn't do one week, one, one with the other. I would just kind of mix it up. Whenever I felt like the kids were getting tired of uh, playing on the pad, we'd do keyboard for a week or two. When I felt like they were getting frustrated or, or tired of that, we'd go back to snare drum. So I just, however, uh, I'd kind of gauge on how, how fast the class was moving. And the other thing on keyboard too, as far as dividing it up, I would always have the students um, say the na names out loud when they're reading. Uh, and I would do this with them, wind players also. Uh, I would have them uh, say the note names out loud first when we're trying to work on, on uh, just reading notes. And then uh, wind players, they could like finger through as they were saying the note names and I'd have the percussion that's use their index fingers and finger through on the keyboard as they were saying the note names out loud. Then the third step, was pick up the mallets and actually try to play the part. So I kind of, I tried to break down the uh, keyboard uh, uh, playing as far as that also, because there's two steps there. There's recognizing the notes on the staff and then there's actually trying to find the note on the on the keyboard. So um, anyway, so it was very similar to what Scott was do, would do. Okay, we got one more question. Jonathan McCullough, current situation is that seventh grade students have not played their instruments for one year. This is because of the school schedule starting next week, I will be restarting rehearsals with my seventh graders to get percussionists back in the program who left the program. What would you recommend? Uh, good luck. Um, no, um, I mean, obviously kind of revisiting the fundamentals is super important. Um, one thing that, you know, a little bit of candy you can put out to them. Um, I don't know if, you know, I actually have one of the directors on the percussion solutions page. I mentioned, you know, cause she was trying to, she didn't have enough instruments for all the kids and she was trying to come up with an economical way um, to do things. And I mentioned, you know, have you ever done a trash can ensemble? And it's kind of sad because at Dickerson, you know, we've played at PASIC and Midwest and the national festival and our state convention and all these different things. And in East Cobb where we live, we're known for our trash can band. And that's all anybody ever talks about in East Cobb is the stupid trash can band. Um, but it's very cheap to put together. Um, and actually, if you go to Home Depot, 
you know, or Lowe's and tell them you're going to be playing on their orange buckets, there's a very good chance they'll give them to you. Um, they started doing that with us when somebody saw us out playing. They're like, well, hey, have you, has anybody from Home Depot been giving you this, this stuff? So got to where I would walk in, they'd give me a hundred, couple hundred dollars worth of gift cards and then watch me very closely to make sure I only brought out trash cans and, you know, lids and stuff like that. But um, that's a really good, um, really good way to get kids excited. Um, you know, there's just, I don't know what it is about banging on trash cans. The kids love it. Um, I'm actually st starting out with the sixth graders right now. So that's a good way to kind of revisit. And if you decide to do that, um, send me an email or a message or whatever. I don't know if you're on Facebook and I can kind of help you out um, in terms of what to do. I'll give you, I've got a trash can piece if anybody wants it. I called it garbage. Um, it's a fitting name, but you know, I wanted a piece that was easy to memorize and for kids to put together. We didn't have to spend a whole lot of time being artistic. I just wanted something simple that they could put together and we could use for gigs in the community. Um, and that would also help you as well, just kind of getting, you know, some of that, you know, becoming more visible in your community. Yeah. And just, even though you're starting at seventh graders, just make sure you understand that you still got to go back and do fundamentals. And it, it, there's a lot of people in the same, you're, you're not by yourself there. A lot of people are going to be doing a lot of fundamentals the next several years to try to make up for what we lost this year. So, so do make sure that you continue with the fundamentals. And there's actually a handout in the, uh, the Dropbox link that they, they showed earlier that uh, I call it, uh, well, it's snare drum fundamentals. Anyway, that's whatever, that's what I use uh, with all my students when I'm starting them. And whenever I go into any school that I'm working on, uh, I start with that sheet. So maybe that, that sheet can also be helpful for you also. It's just working on the basic strokes of playing snare drum. And guys, we're obviously, you know, we ended up doing some questions, which is absolutely fantastic. And if you have any more questions, please put them in. Um, so just want to let everybody know, because we, we won't get through the rest of this, most likely. Um, I mean, we can keep going. It's fine. But, um, you know, the, there's actually a clinics folder in there. And it's got a clinic that I did a couple of years ago at Western Carolina for their percussion majors. Um, but this, there's a PDF of this clinic in there also. So you can go through it. If there's something we don't get to and you want to check it out, that would be um, perfectly awesome. Um, so, Mike, you mind if I maybe jump into a couple of these real quick? No, go ahead. If you, um, so, you know, the first couple of these are actually, you know, if you want to talk about maybe the first three things real quick, actually, since these are yours. Yeah, no, th these are just some things that are, uh, you know, going into band rooms that I see. Uh, I like to think it's kind of common sense, but it doesn't always happen. But it, it makes your it helps your rehearsals run so much smoother if you'll do these these things, you know, putting the uh, the selections that you're going to rehearse in order up on the board so the percussionist can get set up, because uh, they don't go to just one place to get their instruments; they have to go to multiple places. So you you got to make sure that you you let them know ahead of time of uh, of what to set up and. Set up time in between selections. Of, of, uh, make sure you don't start the next selection without the percussion set or not set up. Or you know, tell them you got a minute to set up. I'm gonna go ahead and rehearse this piece. But uh, make sure you engage the percussion when you start that next selection and that they're ready to go. And at the end of class, oftentimes, you know, we as band directors we rehearse right up to the bell, and so the no one has any time to put anything away. And then sometimes we wonder, well, how's the instrument? How, uh, you know, how are we losing instruments? Why are things not covered? Why are things not put away? So make sure you give uh, the percussion kids time at the end of the class to always put away their instruments. And it, it just got with my band classes, they knew, I mean, we, I told them ahead of each class, I told them ahead of time, hey, when we get to five minutes before the bell rings, uh, you guys, no matter what we're doing, start putting away. And so I just knew that was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I made sure they didn't start early. Uh, but they, was, they got to be where they were really good about whenever the clock hit that, uh, you know, the, that time that they all were, they went ahead and started putting away. And we never had to worry about instruments being left out or, or losing things. So that helped us out quite a bit. Yeah. And I want to jump on a couple more things real quick. So the next thing, the hardest thing to play in time are repetitive notes and rhythms, uh, especially quarter notes. And I know, you know, I've played bass concert bass drum before on a march. And you've got the conductor sitting there going, stay right with my hand. You know, and typically when I do these clinics, I'll have everybody, I'll get up and conduct and say, okay, everybody clap and stay right with me. And it's surprising how hard that is. And I'll say, okay, now sing, 
dun, 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 bum, 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 you know. So I actually have the bass, concert bass drum players, especially on a march, learn the melody. And if they can sing the melody and clap quarter notes with that, my march is always going to be in time. So that's just one thing to think about. Um, I do tell my kids wind and percussion, they look at me for the general idea and they fine tune the ensemble by, ensemble by listening to each other. Um, rotating parts, stuff like that. Percussionists breathe too, important. Teach percussionists to conduct. Um, Mike made a good point. Teach students how to set up and put away hardware. If you don't teach them, they won't know. Yeah, I found that that's a, a, an area that's kind of lacking. <laughs> uh, when, when a kid signs up for percussion, they don't automatically know how to set up that hardware. And the thing is, uh, sometimes we band directors shy away from that. It's like it's something totally different. And the, the thing is, it's so simple. Every, every single piece of hardware has three wing nuts that does the exactly the exact thing. And, uh, you know, you've got the wing nut for the legs. You have the wing nut that affects the height of the stand. You have the wing nut that uh, adjusts the tilt of the stand. The only stand I know that, that doesn't have a tilt is uh, maybe a trap table. And then you also have the wing nut that attaches whatever you're putting on the stand. You know, for the snare cradle, you've got the knob on the bottom. Uh, cymbal stands, you've got the knob that goes on top of the cymbal. In uh, concert times, you got a you got a, a wing nut there that tightens them on, and so make sure you get back there and learn how to set up that hardware so you could teach the percussion kids. Because again, I go into a lot of schools and it's uh, it's kind of a mess back there, and it and it's really it's really not that di difficult to deal with. If you'll just remember, there's four wing nuts, and it, it's really not that that difficult. I remember trying to put together a bassoon the first time. Now that was difficult, uh, and so uh, especially for uh, for me being a, a percussionist, but uh, yeah, so learn the hardware, four wing nuts, and that's it. You're good to go. And th there are some questions, Scott, if you want to get to those. Oh, goodness. But, um, well, we have access to the chat and the side slide deck after this session. The slide is going to be, yeah, that's included in the Dropbox link. Good job. Um, Donna, teach middle school band and purchase a beautiful used marimba. What book would you recommend? Um, percussions don't come from the feeders with any amount of experience. Um, there are a couple of really good ones out there. Um, Mark Wessel's Fresh Approach to Mallet Percussion. I know both of us have used in the past. I think that's yeah. that's what you use for the most part, right? Um, yeah, and Ken and yeah. Wiley, Ken and Wiley also has some good stuff too. Um, Chris, can you speak to the growing trend across the country of requirements for beginning percussionists to rent or own a full-size mallet instrument instead of a percussion kit? Um, so you guys all know about the bell kits, right? So those things, um, I think they discourage kids from wanting to play keyboard instruments, to be honest with you. And it's kind of funny, I got, I got hooked up with KHS um, years and years ago because I made it a point, we have a, what we call a first lesson night where we talk to the parents about, the, like the other instruments, they learn how to put the instrument together, how to clean it, how to take it apart, how to make the first sound with the parents sitting in the room. I had a meeting with the parents and I would always have a student model marimba sitting up there. Majestic has a beautiful one. Um, and I would have a bell kit and I would get out there with the hardest bell mallets and I would just play like a C scale. And you'd see all the parents kind of doing this. And it's like, yep, that's what the kids think too when they practice on it, if they practice on it. And I get the most beautiful pair of marimba mallets I have and I play a C scale on the, the student model marimba. And then I just talked to them about the, the learning difficulties that is that are inherent with playing on a bell kit and uh, just how frustrating it was for me learning to play on that tiny little instrument. You know, you're trying to see such small bars and everything and you're trying to read music. Um, so I've been a big advocate for, gosh, you know, I guess my whole career probably of trying to get a, a full size marimba. Now I don't require it, some schools do. Um, I think it's, you know, the rental of one typically works out to around the rental of saxophone if I'm correct. But I, I don't require it. By I highly, highly, highly encourage it because I don't want to. I don't want a kid. You know, I don't want the finances to be a necessarily a deterrent. We're in a pretty, you know, financially good area. But also, don't want a kid saying, "Well, I can't do percussion because we can't afford the marimba and the drum pad and the drumsticks." But um, yeah, I tell them they need something at home, and I really push that. You know, student model instrument. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. 
No, I just I wound up using Bell as the first part of my career because that's all there was then. But I, towards the later years, I really pushed the marimba. Yeah. And the, the, the kids can use that marimba throughout high school. They can't use those bells. We, we would use the bells their sixth grade year, and then we would never use the bells ever again. And so I just felt like it was a waste of money where if they, they rented that marimba or bought that marimba, they could use that for the rest of their percussion career. Yeah. Um, Carl has a question about rotating percussion parts. I, we, right now we have separate percussion class for seventh and eighth grade. So we actually don't join the band until a week or two before performance. But before we had our separate percussion class, I would have the kids rotate every day. And it used to drive the head director crazy when we first started doing it because we would get the kid playing the snare drum part okay, and then the next day there's another kid up there. So it created some issues at first, but then once we got closer to performances, we had kids that had better experience, better knowledge on how to play the instruments, better reading skills, um, knowing how to play all the other parts actually helped them play their part in time because they knew what everybody else was doing. And then the first time we had a kid break his arm right before our performance evaluation, and it was like, okay, next up, you know, and the fact that there was never the, the excuse of, well, so-and-so's, you know, what, where, where's the snare part? Well, so-and-so's out. Well, get up there and play it. You can play it too. So we used to do it every day and it ended up, you know, working well for us. And, you know, usually depending on what was going on, if we were playing for some, for a conference or something, obviously we'd assign the parts, you know, a month out. If it was just a regular concert, it might be the week before or the week of before I said, okay, snare, bass, you know, that type of thing. So that's, that's how I did it. Um, you know, and again, for me, that tended to work better than having a kid play a suspended cymbal part, you know, for, for a month, you know, which I think is, is kind of detrimental to their enthusiasm and their education. Yeah. Guys and, and chime in here. First of all, I want to thank Scott and Mike and we're getting down to our end of our time here. And the next slide, I know we'll have their email addresses if you want to reach out to them. Um, before we be uh, conclude this evening, I do want to let you know that uh, for your educators, you will, should be receiving within an hour of this broadcast a um, an email with the certificate for your professional development hour. And I do want to bring up for next week, which will be the sixth of our seventh series, we will be doing mariachi and K-12 education and its impact on students. And uh, we have two amazing clinicians, just like what we had uh, this evening with Scott and Mike. We have Ramon and Oscar. And even if you don't have a mariachi program, or if you're not even sure if this would even fit your band program, the things that they will be discussing are are not just for mariachi, but they would hold true for anything that you are teaching. But uh, I think you will find this would really be beneficial to any educator out there, uh, especially just how easy something like this could be to put together and the value it has on your students. So that's next week at the same time at six o'clock central time. And again, another professional development uh, certificate will be available for this. So with that, I will let Mike and Scott uh, sign off. And again, want to thank them. Uh, amazing uh, incredible information. I know we went a little bit longer because you have so much great stuff to say. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Thank you so much for inviting us to do it. It's been an absolute pleasure. We actually love talking about this stuff. Um, so I know, you know, Michael probably say the same thing, but if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to use the, the Dropbox stuff for your kids and yourselves to, to learn. And if you have any questions about it, by all means, email, Facebook, whichever, you know, is easiest and, and uh, you know, I'm happy to help you, and thank you so much for for tuning in and you know joining us on this. You never know if anybody's going to show up, so it's good to see people on. Mike, yeah, no, exactly what Scott said. I mean, both of us really do enjoy talking about this. Uh, we've been doing this for a little while, so we, we really do enjoy talking about it. So if you have any questions, again, Facebook, uh, email, feel free to contact. We'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. And please look at the information and the the link. I think there's a lot of good information in there.